1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 12. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to, this more, to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, but that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God, who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. First Thessalonians 4 verses 1 through 12. First Thessalonians is the first letter that Paul writes to a particular church in the New Testament. In the first three chapters of First Thessalonians, Paul establishes himself as an apostle. By God's grace, Paul and his team planted this new church at Thessalonica. However, Paul and his team had to leave early before they could uh, truly establish the church. They were persecuted by the Jews on, uh, of the local synagogue. Paul and his team were smuggled out at night and they went to Berea. They were worried about the state of this new Thessalonian church. Eventually, Paul sends Timothy, a young apprentice, a apprentice mission worker, to Thessalonica to encourage this new church. Timothy returns to Paul, who is now in Corinth. Timothy has good news about the Thessalonian church. They are growing in their faith in Jesus the Messiah. They are also uh, developing relationships with each other. This is a miracle. This new Thessalonian church consists of Jewish and non-Jewish people. This coming together to worship God is a picture of how the good news of Jesus the Messiah can bring people together. Jews and non-Jews come together to worship God and Jesus his Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now here in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul further encourages the spiritual life of the Thessalonians. He refers to the final authority of Jesus, the Savior, in their lives. They are saved to live a holy life of being obedient to the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1-2. The Bible teaches us how to live the Christian life. God's, word, God's words not only impact our minds, God's words in the Bible also impact our hearts. As a result, we obey Jesus as our Messiah. Later, Paul tells them that being obedient to the Lord Jesus is to live a pure, holy life. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7-8. The words of Paul lead us to this question. What does it mean to live a pure, holy life? This also leads us to the next verse. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, to, uh, that you should avoid sexual immorality. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. When God calls us to live a pure, holy life, God 
sanctifies us. God sets us apart from others. The word sanctified means to be set apart, to be made holy. God sets us apart to be God's people, a people belonging to God. God takes us out of the world in which we live in to be part of God's family. To be holy means to be set apart for God. We still live in the world, but we are a people belonging to God. We become the church. We are God's people. We are a people belonging to God. We are a holy people. As Paul further develops his thoughts on living a holy life, he refers to sexual purity. We must remember that the Greco-Roman world of the first century was quite a sexually promiscuous society. Both the Jews and the Christian movement take God's seventh commandment seriously. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20 verse 14. It is the Jews and the Christians who model a life of being family-centered within the synagogue or the house churches. Here are Paul's words on sexual morality or sexual purity. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 6. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans, who do not know God, but that in this matter no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins, as we told you and warned you before. God on, not only brings Jews and non-Jews together within the house churches in Thessalonica, the church family in Thessalonica now functions as a safe place for people to be part of, for people to belong to. They meet as sisters and brothers in the Lord Jesus and seek to encourage each other as disciples of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Therefore, church to them is more than the worship gathering on Sundays. The church is a coming together of people who believe in the Lord Jesus to read the Bible, sing songs, pray prayers to God and enjoy fellowship with each other. This is what the church exists for. The church is the people, not the steeple. Paul's words here, therefore, are what is known as counter-cultural compared to the culture of the Greco-Roman world of the first century. People are not meant to be reduced to mere sexual objects. Through the church, God is restoring people to what it means to be created in the image of God. The church is a restoring community. God transforms us as human beings into uh, created in the image of God to be part of God's community. The church is the transforming community. Here's a story from Todd who tells us about the practice of prayer in his church community. His church started praying for people who were sick and in need of healing. Some years ago, our congregation began offering anointing with oil and prayers for healing for those in our community. At first, people were hesitant to ask for prayer or to come forward to receive anointing for physical, emotional, or relational scars. But in time, these healing services became very important to our congregation. Now, it is not uncommon for dozens of people to seek healing and prayer. We easily forget that all of us are broken people. Each of us has needs that may require God's healing touch or the support of a caring community. Indeed, great things happen when we open our lives to God's amazing grace. Consider your life today. Where are you in need? What prayers for yourself, your family, and for others do you need to offer? Christianity is not a solitary faith for only the strong, but a bond that calls us to pray for one another in our infirmities and our need. 
And often in our weakness, we discover the strength of God. Timothy, the apprentice worker, tells Paul about the love that the Thessalonian church has for each other. They are hoping that Paul can visit them again. Paul now advises them that the love they have for each other must extend beyond Sunday morning. The love they have for each other should be extended to people they meet during the week. Through them, God is reaching out to their co-workers, their neighbours and their relatives. Today we meet for our Sunday morning worship gathering. When we leave here after the benediction, we, should, we often think that our worship ends here and we can return home to our normal lives. Are we done with worship then? Is worship just a Sunday morning activity? Worship is more than that. Worship is the life of responding to the God who saves us. Worship is the life of responding to the God who saves us. There was a problem with the church at Thessalonica. There were some who did not seek word and relied on members of the Sunday congregation for help and handouts. Paul now corrects them. He urges the members of the Thessalonian church to mind their business and not gossip with others. They are to work with their hands. They are to make it their ambition to lead a quiet life during the week. They are to work with their hands to earn their livelihood. 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 to 12. And in fact, you do not love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 to 12. Paul tells them that they are to work for a living with diligence. As they do so, they will earn the respect of outsiders. When they work during the week, they witness to the presence of the Lord Jesus the Messiah in their lives. Their Sunday worship inspires them to worship God during the week. They give glory to God on Sundays and on Mondays. Worship does not end with the benediction. In some ways, worship begins with the benediction. We leave, place, we leave this place eager to worship God in all that we do during the week. Ted is part of a church planting team. They hope to start a new church. Years ago, a church planting friend advised me that the key to growing a successful church is to remain focused on Jesus' command to love God and one another and his instructions to make disciples. As we prepared to launch our new church, we wanted to stay focused on these principles. The journey has been anything but easy, but Jesus reminds us daily, I am with you always. At our church, we try to think about reaching one person, one family at a time. So every day, our church is intentional about meeting new people sharing our story, and more importantly, listening to theirs. We go regularly to schools, movie theatres, restaurants, bars, parks, and community outings, listening. And as we listen, uh, loving, connections are loving connections are formed. Our commitment to loving God and neighbour and to make disciples has helped us to grow a strong church. About uh, two years ago, as a church family, we were blessed to celebrate our 201st anniversary. In 1821, a group of farming immigrants from Scotland and Ireland settled in this part of Canada. Some of them were United Empire loyalists who escaped from the U.S. And the U uh, when the U.S. declared independence from Great Britain. Since then, our church family has welcomed people from all over the world. 50% of our church family were born outside Canada. I am born, I was born outside Canada. We are a church who welcomes people whether they are born in Canada or whether they are born outside Canada. I believe that this is our call as a church. We seek to make anyone who visits us feel welcome. 
We are a church for visitors. We survived COVID, and by God's grace, we still have a Sunday morning worship. However, sometimes we wonder if God is leading us uh, where God, however, sometimes we wonder where God is leading us to as we go forth into the future. We pray for people, resources, and financial resources. The Church of the Thessalonians reached out to other churches throughout the province of Macedonia. Their love for each other extended beyond Thessalonica. Paul acknowledges this call of God on their lives. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 10. Now about your love for one another. We do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 to 10. Sometimes we get so busy with our lives, we fail to remember God's call on our lives. Or we get so involved with the specifics that we forget God's call. God still reminds us of His call in His still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. We might forget God or His call to us, but God never forgets us. He reminds us that He is there for us all the time. God is with us and for us. In the Old Testament, there is a story of how God calls the little boy Samuel. It is found in the book of 1 Samuel. I remember reading this story with my two children when they were young. <coughs> Excuse me. This is before they go to bed. We would reenact how God calls out to Samuel three times. Samuel! 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 My children would laugh as they imagined themselves to be Samuel. This is what Eli, Samuel's mentor, says to Samuel after the third time of God's calling. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling us as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. 1 Samuel 3, verses 9 to 10. Here is a story from June about discovering the call of God or the voice of God. A male cardinal lives in my neighborhood. I heard him far more than I ever see him. Every day I look forward to hearing his distinct call. Surprisingly, I can usually recognize the cardinal's call despite the morning airs being filled with the songs of other birds. Yet at times I can barely hear the cardinal, or I miss it altogether because I am involved in another task. Similarly, listening for the cardinal's song, among others, I must make the effort to hear God's voice. The Old Testament passage of 1 Samuel uh, shows us how Samuel learned to recognize God's voice and to listen for it. Our fast-paced world makes it easy to become caught up in our commitments. Perhaps all we hear are the calls of our jobs, our families, and our finances. Where is God's voice among all this? When I take time to slow down and still myself, to listen to God in prayer and through Scripture, I learn to recognize the voice of God who has been with me all along. I just need to listen. Amen.